Good morning, Irvine. Good morning. Here we go. One more session. Now, tomorrow morning, domani, tomorrow morning we will have the examination. You will be examined. The examination will start at what time? Eight, eight zero zero. The examination will run how long? One hour and thirty minutes. Yeah, I don't know. More than one hour, less than two hours. Okay. I have to write the test and then get a sense of how long I would like it to be. Okay. But it will be of comparable difficulty and and scope as the sample final, and it will be based on the material after the midterm, although physics builds inexorably, so that relies on stuff from before the midterm like all of your knowledge in mechanics and all of your knowledge in thermodynamics and statistical physics, but focused on electricity and magnetism, that topical area which has changed the world enormously. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little bit of wrap up and focus on how to study for the exam and how I would like you to carry these skills forward that you've gained in doing your physics. So we'll do a last few little bit of equations on the board. I've been over the course of this quarter doing as many examples of physics as we could put into this lecture. I don't think we could have put in any more examples than we've done. Uh, and you guys have all had a chance to participate and help with one or more of those. Uh, demonstrations of the physics examples that we could do. And then uh, hopefully that has uh, allowed you to start to have a little voice of nature, that you're starting to hear nature talk to you and you hear voices also. All right? And not just the voice of fear that your exam is tomorrow morning. Okay, the voice of joy that you get to speak with a, uh, a language now that you've gathered some more ability to use. So uh, tomorrow and, and tonight while you're studying, uh, or the rest of today while you're studying, I hope you enjoy every moment that you can in that and that uh, you find it's a, a useful way to see how much you've taught yourself and how much I've helped you learn and then how much you're able to express. Remember, we want communication skills. So tomorrow is the communication to, to me about the physics that you've developed an understanding for. When you do the kinds of problems that we look at in physics, remember, it's possible that you can do part of it, but not all of it. It's possible you can do part of a problem that's in the middle, but not at the start. It's possible you get somewhere in it and realize that what you've written isn't right, and, and making a note that the uh, judgment that says, oh, this is, this is nuts, is a, is a valuable thing to conclude, all right? so. Uh, I want you to bring all your brain power in and uh, have the right level of caffeine and the right level of sleep, exercise, and all that stuff to have a good time tomorrow. So I hope you're looking forward to tomorrow. And I sensed from that exhale that you're not so much looking forward to tomorrow. But, but tomorrow it will be done, right? Oh. So, <laughs> ah, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So. Let's write down uh, our, our equations that we want to cope with, right? If we're going to write down the integral of E dot equals to the enclosed charge over epsilon naught. We could write down integral of B dot ds equals zero. We could write down this one. We can write down the 
we can write that down. And we have now arrived at a place where I snuck an extra term in, didn't I? So fear not. We'll work our way towards that. These four equations, to me, are a prose that is among the most beautiful ever put down on paper. There is a symmetry in these equations which is very helpful in guiding the mind for the pattern recognitions of things when you're looking at it just from abstract reasoning kinds of the mathematician's kind of perspective. And there is a broken symmetry in this. Charge, no charge. Minus sign, no minus sign. So the broken symmetry adds to some of the beauty in my mind Things that are perfectly symmetric are not pretty in people's aesthetic judgments, typically. If we look at these things as a collective whole, these are often referred to as Maxwell's equations or the Maxwell equations. Named after, oh, as a collective whole, James Clark Maxwell, one of the most phenomenal experimental physicists ever to have walked the planet and also quite capable as a theoretician. And Maxwell helped put them into this form of mathematics and also added this last term down at the bottom on the right, that mu naught epsilon naught d phi e dt. That term, by adding it to these equations, causes these equations to describe the propagation of light. Light waves are described by these equations when that term is added. And I mean described in detail. You can make a living with these equations for the rest of your life. So <laughs> the combination, and we'll see how you get light waves, but have no concern. The light waves are in chapter 31. Do you think I'm going to assign that for overnight reading? What do you think? <laughs> I'm not going to ask you any questions out of chapter 31 material. But I can't help myself. I can't give you these equations without giving a sense of completeness to them. OK, so these Maxwell equations. The physics, what is on the board? Chalk is on the board. Okay. The physics is what these things describe. The physics is the examples we did day in and day out endlessly here. The physics is the things that you touch, feel, measure, observe, and can do to some small degree control. The physics here is that electric charges make electric fields. And it gives you a sense of a quantitative way to move that statement forward. The physics on this next one is we haven't found magnetic monopoles. Magnetic charges don't seem to be out there. That's not to say they don't exist. It's just to say we haven't got them in the description we're using here. The next one says uh, E dot DL. That's electric fields driving things around closed loops. Closed loops over on the right and closed surfaces on the left. Even though the integral symbol looks the same, we look to the differential element to find out what it is. ds, could that be a, a length? ds could be a length, couldn't it? A little incremental like dx. A little incremental path length is often written ds. So I write it with a big S, capital S to think of it and help remind me that I'm thinking about areas, not lengths, when I do that one. And similarly, I do that here. Some books put an A here, DA, a big capital A, to kind of remind you of area instead of a big DS. But I favor my brain for some reason. I usually write an S. Over here, the integral is the same in appearance, but we look to the differential and we see a DL and we think, oh, this is going along a path. So the integral means closed path. And this one is telling me electric fields form around those paths, those closed paths, when there's a time-changing magnetic flux. And that minus sign tells me that time-changing magnetic flux drives currents, when possible, to oppose that change. 
if there's an electric charge that can move, this equation is going to tell me that charge will move to try to produce some magnetic field to oppose the change in flux. Time changing magnetic fields create electric fields. Time changing magnetic fields create electric fields. Now let's look at this last equation. Again, a closed something or other. We see it's along a path, so it's a magnetic field. The magnetic field along a path. Now, do magnetic fields push particles along those paths? No. Magnetic fields push charged particles perpendicular to the magnetic field, don't they? So this is a little more complicated in interpretation. But we go over to this side and we see currents, electric currents, make magnetic fields. And there's a plus sign in front of that. Increase the current, we increase the magnetic field. And there's another term that I've added here. It says time changing electric flux. Electric flux. Time changing electric flux creates magnetic fields. Wow. Not only that, but there's a plus sign here. That means that if we increase the electric flux, we will increase the magnetic field. And we see then, let's go through the reasoning of the physics, not worrying about the math, the physics. If the magnetic field changes, it makes an electric field. Okay, let's start in our minds with a condition where the electric field was zero. If the electric field is zero, and we have a time-changing magnetic field, that means the electric field became something, didn't it? So the electric field was changing in time. If the electric field is changing in time, that says the electric flux is changing in time. If the electric field here is changing in time in this electric flux, what does that tell you is happening to B? B is changing in time then also. Okay. Yeah, I know yeah, there's a step in there that you wanted to have, but let's skip that one, right? And so this means that if there's a wiggle in the electric field, it's going to wiggle the magnetic field. If the magnetic field wiggles, it wiggles the electric field. Now we have a dance. The time-changing electric field makes a time-changing magnetic field, makes a time-changing electric field, makes a time-changing magnetic field. We have a couple, a duet, right? two things that now are self-sustained. You will notice in these equations, I've got mu naught and epsilon naught. That's free space. That's vacuum. The absence of anything, we still have those two terms with the flux changes in time. It means that light waves can propagate through vacuum. It means these equations predict that light waves move without any material present and that the electric and magnetic fields have this dance, this duet that they do, as the uh, light waves propagate. They propagate at a speed that's related to that mu naught epsilon naught, the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, in vacuum. So these are Maxwell's equations as written with vacuum, and then you put in some charge and current. They are a complete set of equations and tell us all kinds of things to the degree we know. They are incomplete in the sense that, well, maybe sometime someone will find another term here. Maybe there's another term that will get added by something that we haven't observed yet. It does not make these equations invalid. Okay? As we go through history, you think about Newton with F equals dPdt. And you think about Maxwell with these equations. Okay, let's start with Newton. We write down F equals dPdt, which you think of commonly as F equals ma in its application. And then, a couple hundred years later, people with fuzzy white hair started studying this stuff and came up with special theory of relativity, right? Albert Einstein uh, and, and a bunch of other people. We were working on this, and Einstein came up with relativity. And, and the public image of that is that Einstein somehow proved Newton wrong. 
and that Newton didn't get it right. There's a stunning thing here. Newton actually did get it right, including when it's described with special relativity. He didn't know special relativity at the time that Newton wrote his things down, but the way he said it turns out to be true under conditions of special relativity's considerations as well. So really what happened was Einstein didn't prove Newton wrong. Einstein just expanded what we knew as true into regions of consideration that had not been looked at very much by people in Newton's time. So it wasn't that one thing proved another false, it's that the knowledge we had expanded to cover a wider range. That to me is a stunning thing that Newton phrased it in a way that turned out to be right in an expanded frame. The next one that happens that way that I just can't believe is Maxwell. When you write down these equations about the electric and magnetic fields and write them down in some more detail than this, this was completed in the uh, 1873 approximately, so 140 years ago. And Maxwell wrote these brilliant things and then after that, people figured out how to make light waves like Hertz, Marconi, and these guys. And then Einstein did the special theory of relativity. The way that these equations are written, they also work correctly in special relativity. I'm just I'm absolutely stunned when I look at Newton and Maxwell these guys wrote down things that are almost unfathomably brilliant. And then it turns out that when we have an expanded region that we can look into these things, the way they said it even applied to the future. The understanding in the future, it was so complete. Those two guys, that's just unbelievable. So if you ever go to, uh, to England and you go up to, uh, let's see, Cambridge, in one of the chapel areas where they have all kinds of people buried or chap chapels with statues of famous people, even if they're not buried, there's a statue of Newton that's there. And it's surrounded by names of people that you've read about over time, most famous philosophers of the Middle Ages and the, you know, the Enlightenment and all these t various times. And there's a statue of Newton there. And in Latin, at the bottom, it says, he knew more than anyone. Now that's a very bold statement, isn't it? <laughs> and it sure as heck is not gonna be written on any epitaph for me, <laughs> okay? But I look at that thing and I went, oh, does that mean what I think? And of course, since I'm not very good with Latin, I'm going, hmm, sapiens, uh, you, know, you know. And I went, wow, that's a pretty arrogant statement for whoever put that there, but it's plausible. It's plausible. That's the greatness that sometimes we stand near uh, on this planet. And we get to benefit from this so tremendously from what Maxwell, Newton, Faraday, oh, Michael Faraday, goodness sakes, gave us electricity for making light bulbs, right? And then you get the people doing the practical invention side, doing the engineering, converting the science to engineering like Edison, Tesla, some of those guys, pretty amazing. Okay, now these equations don't end in free space. These equations continue on. As soon as you take a breath of matter, things get changed a little bit. It turns out that for a lot of purposes, air is not that different from free space. So we don't get too concerned when we're doing things in air. But when we have matter that's denser than air, now we put in something for epsilon that's not got the knot on it. We put in something for mu that does not have the knot. And so we can add the properties of matter by altering the equations in a very straightforward conceptual way of just putting the presence of the matter into epsilon and mu. The kinds of things that get done when we do that. The presence of matter means we've added electrons, protons, neutrons, these kind of things, atoms and molecules. And so when we study in great detail, we can make models of what epsilon and mu are. And I've spent a good fraction of the last 40 years just working on little details in epsilon. Plasma physics, which I've spent a lot of time working on, 
is the, the study of these equations where the electricity and magnetism are the dominant things in what you're looking at, and then looking at that mu and epsilon. And I prefer to look at epsilon. That one's been most exciting for me over my life. So these equations can expand to include matter, the presence of matter, by just erasing the knots on the little guys. OK. These equations, then, you should memorize them. I've told you over time that memorization is not the central focus of doing physics. And it's not. Uh, but you guys are biology majors and are quite good at memorizing. And so what I challenge you to do is memorize these four equations. And that's it. I want you to take away how to think from here in a much more complicated way. Memorize these four equations and then promise to tell yourself these equations from memory at least once a year for the rest of your life. These are among the most valuable equations you will ever use in your lifetime. And you will use them every waking microsecond of your life. And actually, they're guided around in your body what's going on while you're asleep as well. So if I think these equations are so important that I dare to tell you to memorize them so that you've got them with you, if I got stuck on a desert island all by myself, and just my wife, about 10 minutes in, she would be saying, look, do something with the equations, would you? Stop, <laughs> stop bothering me. I got other things I want to do. Go do something with your equations. These four equations I would like to have with me. Newton's laws, maybe with the modern sense we have, I might figure them out on my own, and I don't really need to worry about them so much. But these guys, that, that's impressive what these guys have to say especially because this gives us waves, the wave equation. OK. Now, what I want to do is give you a conceptual basis for the approach to your, how do you synthesize your understanding into an evaluation? How do you bring everything together to have a sense of completeness in what you've been learning over these last uh, uh, lectures that we've been doing over the quarter? I want you to take your brain and bring it into focus in a particular way. And so I'm going to do a little slideshow for you of that and set the context for that. But I want to give you a specific example of how I would recommend that you do some of your studying between now and tomorrow morning while still maintaining time for good exercise and good sleep and good nutrition. Right? How to take these things. The physics we have been learning, I have just spent 10 minutes telling you these equations have it all. You can have it all. It's right there. So what you need to do is study the different parts of these equations. Look over the entire object there and make sure you've touched every part of the surface and depth of these equations. So you might think about doing an example. Uh, uh, study this. Study the details of the Maxwell equations with a cohesive problem. Something that will bring everything together, co together, right? And let's look at an example of such. How about a coaxial cable? If you take a coaxial cable, oh, that's a term you probably don't even know, right? Well, it's mentioned in your book, but the book has many pages, and you probably don't even know. OK. We use long wires that are built something like this. So there's a long wire. The wire has 
an outer conductor an insulator and an inner conductor that seems like a little bit of a complicated way to make a wire and so people do this because it has valuable consequences and other people will pay money for the results of it and lives are improved so let's see what you can do with this kind of guy this kind of con uh, wire if we put some charge on the inside wire we could put charge along the inside wire if we put some current along the inside wire, and we can push current along wires, find the capacitance and inductance. That could be our cohesive problem to solve per meter. Now that's probably a very frightening prospect. And in fact, I've suggested this, and in your mind you're going, oh, I wish he hadn't done that, right? It's not something you're looking forward to. So, and same over here, right? Okay, so let's think about what we can do here. Capacitance and inductance. To many of you, you'll think that that's a dull thing. We don't really want to know that. That's not exciting. People don't go down to the coffee cafe and talk about inductance and capacitance per meter. Guess what? Yes, they do. Okay, so travel with me and we have exciting conversations about things like that in cafes. Okay? All right. <clears throat> so. And I'm not alone in doing that. Go to Silicon Valley. It's based on these equations. All of the money there came from these equations. Ah, that got your attention. Okay, so now let's take a look. Capacitance, capacitance has to do with storing charges. And inductance has to do with building up currents. This is a useful problem because it will cause us to go through all of the elements of these equations except this last little term over on the right that I've added. So to find capacitance, you go, I don't know how to do that. I just want to look it up. No, no, no. We want to start with those equations. To find the capacitance, C, right? So what we have to do for that, capacitance is stored charge. Charge is stored. and voltage is built. Voltage is built up. Ah, then. Then we go, voltage is built up, electric fields. Then we go, ah, electric fields, Coulomb's law. Coulomb, Gauss. Right? So we think if we put some charge on that wire and on the surrounding wire out here, we put, so I have minus lambda and plus lambda per coulombs per meter on this, does that make an electric field? Yes, it does. The electric field <coughs> will look like that, right? Or if we look at it from the end, where the pluses and the minuses, the electric field looks like this. And we see from that drawing 
that the arrows are closer together near the center and further apart towards the outside. That's not so readily apparent from the side view, right? Side view and end view. So the electric field here is not constant in space. And you go, oh, that's a little scary for me, electric field not constant in space. Okay, if that's the case, review the parallel plate capacitor, which is a simpler geometry. Remembering that capacitance just depends on geometry, and if there's a material added, the dielectric. So we see the electric field falls off. It gets smaller as you move out. And we go, oh, maybe it falls off as 1 over r. And then you can apply Coulomb's law, or Gauss's law, to figure out exactly what the electric field is. That gets you from, you write down Coulomb, and then, or Gauss, and then that drives you up to the electric field. Then you go, okay, I know the electric field. Now what I want to do is find capacitance. Oh, that's work per unit charge. I'll take a charge from the outside and work a positive charge in to build up a little more on the inside. How much work do I need to do? Oh, integral E dot DL. I do my voltage, integral E dot DL, and then I found out how much work I had to do to bring that charge in. Then I can get the capacitance per unit length. So by doing this part of that problem, I've got Gauss's law looked at, and I've built up potential and stored some charge. <clears throat> now, we go over and we look at inductance. Why the L naught, right? So we can look here at L and say, oh, what do we need to do? Oh, uh, let's see, that's currents built up. Currents built up. So if I want to do that, well, that means the magnetic field was built up, wasn't it? Okay, if I want to find that, then I need to find the magnetic fields. If I want to find magnetic fields, I've got a couple ways to do it. I can have time changing things, or I can have currents. And this one will start with a current, make a current do it instead to start with, right? So we'll say we'll grab Ampere's law. And we'll do exactly the same. I got a current. Well, let's do it on the next board so that it's got to, uh, I can do it this way. We got a current flowing here on the inside. We got a return current flowing on the outside. So you push some charge down there and it comes back on the outside. But on the outside, that current will not contribute to a magnetic field inside the wire if that is uniformly placed. If this is uniformly distributed on the outside, that's not going to contribute anything. Try to persuade yourself why from looking at the physics that's going on. The one on the inside makes a magnetic field, doesn't it? And it makes a magnetic field that goes into the board here and comes out of the board up here. Or if we look from the end, with the current going into the board, the magnetic field is going like that. And the magnetic field
is stronger towards the center and weaker further out. And is zero outside. The magnetic field as a function of distance on this guy will be strongest at the inner conductor, coming down and goes to zero at the outer conductor. So let's put in a radius A and a radius B. So this particular kind of cable confines the electric field and the magnetic field to between the inner conductor and the outer conductor. Outside the cable, the fields are zero on a perfect coaxial cable. Not quite true in reality, but this is a perfect cable, a simplified circumstance, pretty close to reality. And again, with our physics and the way we do these things and think about things, we know that we can measure it, we can decide if it's true. It's not subject to agreement. It's subject to measurement. The observation is that it's true, and then we ask ourselves, how close do we need to know? If the model is, if we only need to know within 10% and the model gets it correct within 1%, good model for our purposes. If we need a more complication in the model, we can add it. Sometimes we need more complication in a model, we can't figure it out. Then we're going to do some new physics and discover something new. And then we get all excited because it was difficult. And it's fun to do that too. So now we are able to find the magnetic field, and it goes as 1 over r inside. Oh, gee, the electric field went as 1 over r as well, between the inner and outer conductors. Then we found the magnetic field. With the magnetic field, we can find the magnetic flux. And then we can find the inductance per unit length. And it turns out that that combination of the capacitance and inductance per unit length allows light waves to propagate, electromagnetic waves to propagate between these cable uh, inner and outer surfaces. And we can send radio signals along these coax lines. Yes? where work came in, like for the capacitance part, where work comes in. If we're going to make capacitance, capacitance, C is Q over V, the ability to store charge. So to get that capacitance, I have to figure out how much charge I brought in divided by voltage, how much work I did to build up that charge that's there. So when I bring in the first charge on an empty capacitor, there's no work done. So if you're ever asked to push charge onto a capacitor, volunteer to be the first one in line all the time, right? The first charge that gets pushed on, there's no work done. The second charge now has to do work against the force of that first charge to get there. And again and again. So as the charge builds up, there's more work done. So what we can do is calculate the electric field when all the charges are there in this circumstance. So this is Go back to go back to the capacitance picture to consider how to find V. Remember the voltage is the difference in potentials between two places, the difference in the amount of work per unit charge between two locations. So if we start here in the inner conductor, so that's at R equals A I used for that. And we want to go out to the outer conductor. So we have some plus charges here, and the minus signs are out here. Is that the, yeah, okay. So now if I want to go from here out to here or from here into here, doesn't matter which way, right? You can go either way. So you could do a path and find 
v along this path, it's going to be minus the integral of e dot dl. And you start on one end, and you go to the other. And so you're going to go from, say, r equals a to r equals b, if you wish. Here's our dl. And which direction is e pointing for this one? Out, right? Positive charges are the sources of electric field. Negative charges are the sinks. All right? We have sinks and sources. So we have e is pointing this way. And we can do our integral e dot dl from a to b. That's our voltage change, isn't it? And that gets our answer for what you're asking. So break it down into one place where you want to ask that question, just like she did, and then go answer that question. Now you have that question answered. You building the entire puzzle into one great picture by asking a question like that. Okay? Find how to do it. Then when you have figured out the capacitance and inductance, you could say, oh, what about the energy stored? Oh, that's a half Li squared, or it's a half Cv squared, and you could go figure out what it is for that, too. Then you ask yourself, oh, what happens if I put a dielectric in, or some kind of magnetic thing? Oh, another thing for the final exam, I will not ask you any questions where mu is anything except mu naught. Okay? <laughs> so the idea of understanding how iron works for magnetism, or paramagnetic, ferromagnetic, diamagnetic, don't worry. Be happy. And I'll bring out a ukulele for that, right? OK, so uh, is that useful to know? Yes, but it's complicated, and this is a lot of stuff. So I urge you to do that problem as your review, because that will get you everything that doesn't have a d by dt in it covered. And then drive some currents. Remember, you've got resistance to deal with and power delivery. So drive some currents. Things change in time. You've got some E foldings going on, right? The E to the minus T over tau kind of stuff. And uh, let's see, what else before I turn on the show? Look primarily to your own observations. The examples that we did in class are the ones that are in my mind. I will write the test with a substantial amount of those examples as the problem basis. They are a shared experience. You saw them. You got your observations, and you learned to be a physicist by how to make and write down your notes and things. And we're going to work with those. Those will be a substantial part of the exam, OK? As promised from the very start. And I'm very consistent about trying to follow exactly what I've said I will do. OK, so that's, so the, we have, uh, do you have other questions before I then I want to convert to showing you a series of slides for the remaining lecture portion? Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Sorry, another question. Um, can I ask a general question related to capacitance? Yes, you may. Um, I know that generally when you're talking about capacitance, you're talking about the amount of energy that you're putting into the capacitor. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering if you have any sort of general ideas of how that would work in Okay, so the question is, if we think about capacitors as being like parallel plates or some other kind of geometry, there's one plate and another. There's a second. And then we know the difference in the separation between them is what tells us the geometry that's involved. So many capacitors have two plates. And so you got a plus charge somewhere and a minus charge somewhere else. She wants to know what happens when the second plate isn't there. Okay, 
So capacitance is the ability to store charge, and it doesn't require that there be a second plate there. And her particular question is, well, she actually has the answer on the tip of her finger, right? Or on the tip of your tongue. We could have the same kind of concept there. Can we bring in some charge and stick it on the finger? Right, just right on the finger. Yes, we could do that. And so the charge is sitting there stored. Could we bring some more in? Yes. And the capacitance, Q divided by the work done, right, the, the voltage, says, OK, where's the second plate? All these voltage things are from one plate to another. OK, here's where you fall back to a very simple way of interpreting. If we were to go out to a distance in infinitely far away and say that that is our zero potential, and then push all the charge that got to your fingertip from infinity in to here. Then the second plate is at infinity. It's a long ways away, right? Now, if I'm standing here with my finger, am I actually going to bring the charges from infinity? No. Now, it's not a practical uh, enterprise to do that. I'm going to bring them from somewhere like over on the wall, <laughs> or most. <laughs> My favorite is usually, you know, rubbing the carpet, right? <laughs> okay. But let's look at, if I bring them from the carpet up to here, the distance involved is hundreds of times the radius of this thing. And the potential down here was at ground. So relative to the Earth, I could consider the Earth or infinity as the second plate. And so all I have to do is calculate bringing it in from infinity and charging and storing it here, and I'll get my answer. And I'll arrive at like 4 pi epsilon naught times the radius for the finger of what the capacitance of the fingertip is. Okay. Now, does this stuff matter, even on the fingertip stuff? Yeah, it does. And I got all excited about it a few years ago because of that. You have these fingers, and what's on your finger? Prints. Prints. Fingerprints. Okay, and the fingerprint has got ridges and valleys like this, right? And so that means if your finger is near something, you got the ridge, it's closer to the something, and the valley is further and closer and further and closer and further. And it means then that the capacitance of the finger down at microscopic level on the fingerprint itself varies as you go from the ridge into the valley and the ridge. It's going to be closer, further, closer, further. And that means that your finger lays down a capacitance pattern which is different from mine. And you put your finger down onto something and the location of these different variations in capacitance at a few microns of distance is different for every person. I got very excited about that. And that is used in all your fingerprint detection devices. All my laptops where I have a fingerprint detector where you scroll your finger across it, that's what they're doing. And I got to work with one of those companies for a little while. Yeah, I worked with, did some work for Authentech on this stuff. And then now whenever I go through the, uh, there's another way to do it too with light which got me all excited, too. So how many of you have ever been through the international uh, terminal where you go in, get your passport checked, and you got the little fingerprint devices there, the green light things? I worked on those, too. That was so cool. So now every time I go through international, I go, oh, that's so oh, great. <laughs> I, it, it, so so th this question just leads to endless excitement. OK, that's a great question to ask. So did it answer? Yeah, and more. <laughs> Another question, anybody? Okay, so now let's. Uh, I'm hoping that there are a couple of things that you will take away. One is, this is a very important one to me. We are people of great privilege, you and I. We have arrived at a place on this planet where all of us have the privilege of studying physics. We are able to do that instead of some terrible labor. We are able to study physics in this moment. I'm able to teach it some and enjoy studying it. You're able to study it. This is a place of great privilege in the history of the planet. And so I hope you guys treat that privilege 
with great honor in what you do. It, and if you do, I think you will enjoy it a lot more too. <laughs> okay. Um, now, the other thing I want you to have walked away with was learning some new skills about analytic thinking. How to think. Your immediate reaction may have some elements of clarity and correctness in it when you look at something to make a judgment. But I'm trying to teach you how to add to that, to double check it, to build a more thorough understanding, and to decide at what level of complexity is appropriate for the circumstance, but never to accept just a quick answer, unless you have multiple ways of being assured that it's correct, multiple perspectives that tell you that quick answer is good enough. And then I'm trying to give you the skill set to work past that with some ways of thinking. Okay, now what I want to do is show you some slides. Okay, I have put these slides on the class website this morning. So they should be available for your viewing pleasure later and guide for your studying as well. We do this, go down. Okay, we got that. Now let's see if we can go to a PC. Um, okay, which one should I use? I don't realize these are actually still functioning in this day and age. Okay. Oh, happy people. Um, uh, okay. This is me, isn't it? Okay, here we go. Well, let's see. That's about useless. Let's try a different way of projecting. that work? Okay. I need to turn out the ligates. Does that give the right amount with the mood lighting with leaving the chalkboard light on? Is that good? And because Maxwell's equations will shine brightly no matter what, right? Okay. So this is the kind of perspective and way that I want you thinking is to be using the observed truth as the basis. If I, uh, I'm going to have to do it. I can't stare at it with you. I've got to stare at a separate screen. So this was our examples. We did as much of this examples as we possibly could in this uh, course to get the foundation. It's not abstract stuff. Tied together by general law. And that law is the description can be done in words as well. But we then often start to write down and get very specifically quantitative with the equations we've been doing. And with predictive capability, yes, I am going to get on the airplane. 
I do not expect it to crash. I have a predictive capability of what the likelihood of the crash possibility is. And I tend to get into airplanes who have pilots that have hair that looks like mine because they have lots of experience and they want to enjoy their pension at some time later in the future. <laughs> so, there are lots of ways. Not all of the physics you're going to do is exciting. There were a couple of our examples that were very important and they were terribly boring. But there are some that are fun too. So you want to get yourself in the mood like this. We good? This class is not about how fast you can read, don't worry. You go to Evelyn Wood for that one. Okay, ready? Somebody say yes. yes. I'm, I've run out of patience. Somebody say yes. Thank you. Okay. And carry them with you the rest of your life. But I want you to do physics. Just physics, physics, physics the rest of your life. It's going to have a boundless amount of possibilities and it's going to be based in reality. It is a study of reality so that you will find it's just really useful all the time. For example, a couple days ago I went into the grocery store, I needed to buy some toothpaste. I like to estimate things quickly in my head. I reached down for the toothpaste. The largest toothpaste tubes had a price. The next size toothpaste tube, smaller, had a price. Which one did I buy? The smaller, because the smaller tube was cheaper per ounce of toothpaste than the larger tube. They move the prices around on those things because they think people all get used to the largest one being the most economical purchase, and then they flip the price differential and you buy it a few times before you discover it and they get a little more money. When you go into a grocery store, where are the items most likely to be purchased? Checkout. Yeah, well, certainly you're, you're buying them at the checkout, right? So, so <laughs> there are the impulse items at the checkout. Where are the dairy, the meat, and the bread? In the back. They are always at the farthest corners and separated, so that that will cause you to walk through the whole store. Now, come on down for a second. Yeah, you. It's okay. You go, girl. <laughs> okay. And I forgot your name. I'm sorry. Nicole. Nicole. Okay. Now, look at the two of us, okay? We both walk into the grocery store. Where is her eye height? Put your hand, right hand at your eye height. My right hand. Yeah. Right and my eye height is here, right? The items that are most likely to have the highest profit margin and to draw her attention are placed at her eye level, not mine. I don't do most of the grocery shopping in my family. So the items they're trying to push the hardest are going to be right at your eye level. The items that she can't reach are the ones she is least likely to purchase. All right, the ones way down at the bottom, again, least likely to purchase. So they are spread throughout, okay? They get you to walk to all three corners after you come in. The items are placed primarily for adult female purchasing at that height, and that's the, that's the shelf height that people fight for, okay? And then she walks through, and then they play music designed to get you to stay there for about 47 minutes on average. Have a seat, Nicole, thank you. And uh, uh, get you to walk around through there. And what music do they pick? Yeah, yeah. What I want them to play is, you know, the doors, the who, you know, throw in a little stones, you know. What do they play in your female clothing stores? 
yeah, stuff that I'm not going to listen to. I refuse to go into those stores, right? I want to listen to box partitas and sonatas, okay? So any store that listens to what I want to have in the music, they go out of business next week. Okay. Use the physics. Make your observations and see how people are both being efficient and using ways to get you to make choices. When you do this stuff, follow this kind of process. This is one basic way of thinking in physics that is extremely helpful for people. It's not the only way, but it's a very simple thing. Guess the answer. It's amazing how many decisions you make based on intuition. And it is amazing how often intuition is wrong. The example I gave you uh, where that was just profoundly true is the use of electric cars and people thinking that they have a reduced hydrocarbon consumption because it's an electric car. Not true. Okay? So <clears throat> the uh, ways of developing your intuition to be better involve going through these kind of steps of thinking about things a little more deeply, deciding how well you need to break them down. Uh, how well you need to know what your answer is, and constantly following that trust no one, including yourself. You're trying to build a better way of thinking and a better information base for yourself, not just trusting other people. These equations fundamentally will feed the planet. If you guys eat this stuff and chew on it, digest it, you can then go out into the field and grow stuff from this yourself. You can feed yourselves with this. Know this stuff well. As you can see on the bottom, that answer down below isn't going to work too well tomorrow. <laughs> okay, although I love Calvin's enthusiasm. This is the wave equation, which I did not write for you, and I will not ask you on tomorrow's test, but I cannot help myself from writing it. It's one of the most amazing things on the planet. And, oh. Okay, this one I did show you. Observe truth, that's what we're after. Can you read that or is that out of focus up there? It's good enough? So I can't quite tell on the resolution on some of these things whether they're going to work. There is a place for memorized fact. It is useful, and it drives me crazy. So I like cartoons like this. Now, there's some truth in this. Always doing the calculations, always doing that kind of stuff. Okay? So, you see, physicists always lose the snowball because you're too much in your head, right? Too much calculation can be a bad thing. So, I can give you a life example of that. For many years, I raced cars, and I like racing cars. And I never won a race. I never, ever won a race, okay? I was constantly building electronic devices to measure acceleration, cornering, all the data, the data logging stuff that you see now in commercial uh, operations. I was making circuits like that be back when you guys were born and doing them on my race cars for fun and then selling them to other people in the tracks and things. Okay, so I never won a race because I was concentrating a lot on that kind of stuff and the, one of the crew guys says, listen, McWilliams, get up in the morning, eat a steak, smoke a cigarette, and go out and try to kill something. <laughs> and I said, I don't want to do any of that. 
<laughs> and he says, well, you're not going to win. And I said, yeah, but you know what? At the end of the day, I had more fun than the guy who won. You know? <laughs> and another thing that happened was, over time, I got to where I actually won the championship without ever winning a race. That was a curious thing. Steady and slow builds up over time to where you can have a pretty steady performance. But the guys that win are the ones that are willing to die. Right? Those guys go out and push the envelope just a bit more, and they do get all the glory. And as far as I'm concerned, they can have it, because I have the equations. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways, and they're all good. But uh, this one, you've got to know when to focus and when to go for it. OK, so this is my favorite science cartoon of all time, because I was uh, about to get going working on my PhD. And the guy who ended up being my PhD advisor, we were having lunch, and he wrote down on a napkin. He says, well, I think if we do all a couple years of work on this, you'll get them, them, them. And he wrote like that. And then he wrote an answer. And uh, two years later, three years later, he was right. And the only thing that was different was the number multiplying it in the front on the answer, <laughs> just the numerical coefficient in the front. And so I asked him if I could write a thesis that was 10 pages long and do this. And he said, no. <laughs> you have to explain it. You can't do it. And I said, well, you did it that way. And he said, yeah, but it's your PhD. You can't do that. <laughs> so. Anyway, once in a while that kind of thinking works, but usually it doesn't. <laughs> and it will not get you points tomorrow. <laughs> OK. All right. Now, <clears throat> science has lots of interesting ways of saying things. And there is a lot of science gobbledygook. That is, people say all kinds of things that sound good. So I want you to constantly be skeptical about things. Even though it sounds good, you want to ask yourself, is it true? What's the basis for, is it true? OK? Um, are we done? OK, so the math, the math, the horror, the horror, right? You've got to work with it. It's the language of physics, so it's in, and it's incredibly good at being precise. Uh, so the accuracy part with the math is the hard part for us. I do want you to remember to get the sign right. OK, this is a nice thing about physics. It's not only should we be able to get the magnitude right, but we should be able to tell which direction something is pointing. Right? So you want to be careful. This one may occur to you sometime later today, right? <laughs> 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 
This one may occur to you momentarily, but hopefully not for long tomorrow during the test. Um, the thing I don't like about this cartoon is that guy in the lower right is appallingly similar to me. <laughs> <laughs> I know for a fact that it was not supposed to be me, it's, but it is supposed to be another physicist. There, there is a guy that that is caricatured off of. <clears throat> Don't accept this kind of answer, okay? Now I put this one in for a little sense of irony. Because aren't you on summer vacation? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is one of those moments where I'm going to take a white-haired moment and say, your guys, what you do with your life, I hope we've been showing in this class how taking initiative is an incredibly important element of not just doing science, but getting ahead on things. Just read the top one, you can read the bottom one later. So you have hundreds of millions of transistors, electricity and magnetism stuff in your cell phones, your computers, and all that kind of stuff. Make sure that your use of those is with good satisfaction for your own lives, and it doesn't just make things more hectic. Okay, folks, um, good for your studying. I'm going to look forward to having your words of wisdom on the test tomorrow. Thank you all for taking physics.